Hi guys, welcome to my channel. This is Diamond Painting with Ruby Q. And today I'm going to do a little thing, eh, not diamond painting related, but I hope that you like it. It is a new, um, I guess, segment, new content that I'm bringing to my channel. Um, I'm going to be reading you a book and I'm going to try my best to read it in a uh, semi, you know, like audiobook manner. But if you know me, you know that I am very, very energetic. You know that I am very animated. So you might hear, you know, a little voice different than mine throughout this uh, reading adventure. And also, um, I am going to be putting my own commentary into this. So let's see how this goes. Are you guys ready? Today's book is called American Predator, The Hunt for the Most Meticulous Serial Killer of the 21st Century by Maureen Callahan. To the victims and their families, known and unknown. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Sherlock Holmes. Preface. The rarest form of murder is serial. Despite what we see on CSI or Mindhunter or the films and procedurals that dominate popular culture, people who kill randomly and for no reason are extremely uncommon. It's why they loom so large in our collective mindscape. Okay, <laughs> it's also why many of us think we know of every such American killer. But the subject of this book was unlike anything the FBI had ever encountered. He was a new kind of monster, likely responsible for the greatest string of unsolved disappearances and murders in modern American history. And you have probably never heard of him. Author's note. This book is based on hundreds of hours of interviews with most of the special agents on this case. Passages where someone's thoughts are described are based on information they gave directly. In some cases, FBI interrogations have been condensed and edited for clarity. Part 1 <sighs> Deep breath. On the side of a four-lane road, obscured by snowdrifts five feet high, sat a small coffee kiosk. Its bright teal paint, vibrant against the asphalt, and gray big box stores. Drivers passing by could see the familiar top peaking above the piles of snow, this cheerful but lonely little shack. The night before, 18-year-old Samantha Koenig had been working this kiosk alone. Now she had vanished. She had been on the job for less than a month. She was reported missing this morning. Blah. <laughs> Sorry, she was reported missing the morning of Thursday, February 2nd, 2012 by the first barista to show up at the coffee kiosk that day. That barista felt something was not right. Samantha was usually very responsible about closing the kiosk properly, but this morning things were out of place and the previous day's take was gone. What little the Anchorage Police Department had learned about Samantha in one day left them with almost no leads. She was a popular high school senior who sometimes cut class and maybe had a history with drugs. She got along with everyone. Not just the cool kids. She had two main people in her life. Her boyfriend, Duane, who she'd been dating for almost a year, and her single father, James. Oh, so she had two men in her life. Hmm. Sneaky, sneaky, suspicious. Okay. So, what to make of this scene? Yes, yeah, Samantha could have been kidnapped, but to investigators, it seemed more likely that she had gone off on her own. The police found no signs of a struggle. Inside the kiosk was a panic button, and Samantha hadn't hit it. She'd been using her cell phone before and after she had gone missing. Fighting was doing. Texting him to leave her alone, fighting over the certainty that he was cheating on her. Then again, she had also called her dad, asking him to stop by the kiosk with some dinner. Why do that if she was planning to run away? To the sergeant of the Anchorage Police Department, this seemed like a good test run for field training a novice. He decided to give the case to Detective Monique Daw, a third-generation cop, 35 years old, working her first day in homicide. 
Dahl had spent 10 years in narcotics. Four of those undercover was the DEA. She had a lot to recommend her. Ooh, so she a baddie. Dahl stood out, too, as one of the most glamorous officers in Anchorage. She looked like her name, blonde and beautiful, though she answered to the androgynous, God, I can't say that word. What is this? Androgynous nickname, Mickey. She was married to another star at APD, the handsome Justin Dahl, and they were something of a local power couple. So the sergeant told Dahl, your lead on this. Suspicious circumstance, he called it. Across town, FBI agent Steve Payne was tying up a drug case when a friend at the police department called. This is common practice in Anchorage, a big city that runs like a small town. Cops, FBI agents, defense lawyers, prosecutors, judges, everyone knows everyone. It is the paradox of being Alaskan. This state is home to rugged individualists who nonetheless know there will come a time amid the cold, unpitying winters when they will need help. Payne was told that an 18-year-old girl had disappeared early the night before and had sent some angry texts to her boyfriend. One emerging theory had Samantha stealing the day's take to fund a day or two off on her own. Happened in Anchorage all the time. Damn, dirtbags, right? All right, yet Payne wasn't so sure. Planning to disappear requires long-range strategy and sophistication. Samantha seemed like a young girl with very little money. Payne was a regular at these roadside coffee kiosks and could only guess how little the baristas were paid. These young girls, who often worked alone, were made to wear bikinis in the summer. It was not an easy life. Besides, where would a teenage girl go by herself on a dark and freezing Wednesday night? The weather had been brutal, just over 30 degrees, snow covering the ground. Samantha didn't have her pickup truck that night. Her boyfriend, Duane, did. Anchorage isn't a walkable city. Samantha just wandering off alone and on foot made no sense. If she had gone to a friend's house and she told Duane in text last night, chances were the police would already have found her. He offered help. We've got enough people, came the reply. We think we know what, it, what this is. Payne hung up. This didn't see, this, that, <laughs> sorry. This didn't sit right. As he well knew, the first rule of an investigation was to keep an open mind. You didn't try to fit a personal theory to a possible crime. He had heard that the police never even taped off the kiosk earlier that morning when Samantha was reported missing, and her fellow barista then spent the morning serving customers. If the kiosk was in fact a crime scene, it had already been contaminated. Dang, those cops don't know what they're doing, huh? All right. Unbelievable, Payne thought. This was basic stuff, knowing that the first hours of an investigation are everything. Presenting as they do the freshest leads, the most telling witness interviews. Crucially, investigators themselves are at their most curious and engaged, confronting a brand new mystery with brand new players. This sets the tone for everything to come, with missing people, especially a child. And Payne considered Samantha a child. These earliest moments handled correctly will give investigators the best chance of finding them alive and well. He didn't want to overstep, but he couldn't help himself. He called APD, leaving messages, waiting all afternoon for a reply. All right, I'm going to comment on this real quick. So what I'm learning is that these guys didn't do their job. <laughs> they were like, oh, teenager missing. Oh, well, screw it. Just do your job, other barista girl, and contaminate everything. We don't need a dust for ping fingerprints or anything. <sighs> terrible, terrible, terrible cops. They didn't do their job. All right, reading again. All right, finally, at 8 o'clock that night, Payne's phone rang. It was Detective Dahl. Some things have changed, she said. Payne made the 12-minute drive from the FBI's Anchorage field office over to APD. 
He was six years older than Dahl and had been with the Bureau for 16 years, born and raised in Anchorage, a rarity. Most folks who live here, like Dahl, are expats from the lower 48. Payne understood the psyche of the city. He understood the bias police could have when it comes to Anchorage's poor and troubled. The lost causes. He didn't want to see Samantha dismissed. What a good man. Payne's outward appearance gave little hint of his mettle. No one would ever guess he was a special agent who had worked drugs and violent crime his whole career. Small features, light, slight frame. He looked like an accountant, yet Payne was a born investigator, a self-described obsessive compulsive whose devotion to casework cost him his first marriage. He was a perfectionist who always fell back on the, homin uh, on the homicide investigator's credo. Do it right the first time. You only get one chance. He got teased at the bureau. bureau for, I'm sorry. He got teased at the bureau for a few of his favorite sayings. Cause for pause. Whenever he found a clue or some kind of useful information, Murphy's Law, when a case was on the verge of resolving only to fall apart. Payne thought of Murphy as his personal boogeyman. Dog gave Payne a quick overview of what she'd learned so far. They had just gotten a look at the surveillance video from the kiosk, which the kiosk's owner, nearly 2,500 miles away, had obtained eight hours earlier. This was shaping up to be what Payne had feared, the low prioritizing of an at-risk teenager Samantha's father had spent the past night calling Samantha's cell phone to no avail and spent that next day standing outside the kiosk during his daughter's next scheduled shift from 1 to 8 p.m., hoping she'd come back. Show me the video, Payne said. Now, I'm going to pause here. If you guys want me to insert images and the video into this let me know in the comments and the next chapter before i even begin to read i will show you the image of samantha and the video that they are describing okay all right back to reading just before eight o'clock samantha appears on screen in her lime green top her long brown hair worn down she is relaxed, chatting with a customer through the kiosk window as she makes coffee. She looks like a sweet girl, Payne thinks. Happy. Whoever is outside remains out of camera range. Samantha works very casually, and then two minutes and six seconds into the tape, she suddenly turns off the lights. There's no audio. Samantha's hands go up. Now, all that's visible outside the kiosk is a shadowy figure and what might be the muzzle of a gun pointed at Samantha through the window. The aim is high and the window is low to the ground. So, whoever this is must be tall. Samantha moves gingerly, okay, to the counter, her back to the figure outside. She gets on her knees, she stays that way for over a minute, fidgeting, and then, three and a half minutes in, she gets up walks over to the register and scoops out money from the drawer. The video is so grainy, it's hard to tell if she hands it over or puts it down. She returns, calmly it seems, to a kneeling position. Then, something else has clearly been said because Samantha wobbles to the window, stops, then turns her back to it. Here, at the 519 mark, a large male figure leans halfway inside. It's hard to see for sure, but it looks like he is tying her arms behind her back. Two more minutes elapse, which sounds like nothing until you realize that a man with a gun is outside a very popular kiosk that sits between the parking lot of a huge gym and a well-trafficked road. In this context, two minutes is extremely long. Whew, I feel so bad for this girl terrible. Whoever this is, Payne thinks, either knows what he's doing or knows Samantha. 
This kiosk is tiny, maybe nine feet by five feet, barely propped up off the ground. The wide open serving window makes these young girls extremely vulnerable. How odd that no one ever noticed that before. Seconds later, Payne watches as the man pounces like a cheetah, pushing his way through the window in one swift movement, stomach arching inward, arms extending, landing gracefully on Samantha's right. It happened so fast. Now it is clear. The man is very tall. He is also very composed. He looks out the window, seems to shut it, and talks to Samantha. Things seem fairly normal between them. He picks something up and opens it. Showing it to Samantha, it looks like her purse, and it looks like it's empty. Now, at 8.55, he is kneeling. His broad back is to the camera, his right arm around Samantha. There is white lettering visible on the back of his black hoodie, but it is impossible to read. He is so close to Samantha that they look like one melded figure. He helps her to her feet. Samantha and the man hesitate, look back, then find themselves facing another surveillance camera. He moves Samantha straight ahead through the kiosk's small door, and the outdoor footage shows her and the man slowly walking away, his arm around her shoulder through the fresh white snow. Pause here. So, basically, this guy kidnaps her, but it doesn't look like a kidnapping to investigators. That's what I'm guessing, because I have not read this book, so I'm actually reading it while I'm reading it to you. From what I'm getting is that this guy maybe knew her, maybe he didn't, maybe he was a smooth talker, smooth operator. Okay, I shouldn't be making fun of this, because, like, I guess, yeah, this is true, true story. But, so far... Um, I feel like, I don't know, I'm kind of in between, he knows her and he doesn't know her. Alright, back to reading. <sighs> Man, you kind of lose your breath reading. <laughs> okay. Payne didn't know what to make of the video. Once again, he offered the FBI's assistance, but Daw declined. This might have been her first day, but she was lead and this was APD's case. Also, assigned by APD was Jeff Bell whose useful appearance bleed, bellied <laughs> a, storied, a storied 17 year long career in law enforcement. U.S. Marshals, Federal Task Force, SWAT, Senior Patrol Officer, and three years with the FBI Safe Streets Task Force, which gave him top secret clearance with the Bureau. Bell would be considered the most naturally gifted of the team, a clinical, logical thinker, with the charisma to engage the gang members, drug runners, meth addicts, pimps, rapists, and murderers, who so gamely contribute to Anchorage standing as the most crime-ridden city in Alaska. At APD and the Bureau, Bell was known as the metrosexual. That was not necessarily a compliment. He was a handsome guy with dark features who kept his hair cut high and tight, military style, and his weight in check. He was always well dressed. Bell had Bell was admired by his colleagues. He had the forthrightness and friendliness so common to his native Midwest. He would up in Alaska or he wound up in Alaska after following his college sweetheart, a native, and here they were married. Long ago Bell came to identify, as nearly everyone does, as an Alaskan rather than an American. The rest of the country, everywhere else, was outside. Bell knew Anchorage as painted. Nearly every street corner held some kind of memory for him. A robbery, an arrest, a body. <sighs> that last one, though. <laughs> a body. Yet even Bell was... Stimid? I don't know what that word is. <laughs> By the video. Yes, Samantha put her hands up, and yes, the figure looked like a man, but what was really happening? It was too dark to really see. Why was the conversation taking so long? Bell timed the activity in the video. This man had been outside the kiosk for at least seven minutes, and clearly inside for a little over ten, seventeen minutes total. What in the world, Bell thought, were they talking about? 
These 17 minutes led to the department's first working, working the story. Samantha was likely not a victim. They weren't going to tell the press that, but their response made that clear because APD didn't plan to go public with Samantha's disappearance. That took another two days, the department's hand forced by Samantha's frantic father. All right, guys. So, chapter two is going to be next week. And the reason that I'm stopping right now <laughs> is, one, I have to get my voice used to reading out loud, and two, to see how you guys like this. So... Thank you for listening <laughs> and watching. Um, give this a thumbs up if you liked it. Comment below what you think. And I will see you next week with chapter two. Thank you guys. Have a nice day.